Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm Quinn, and today I'm going to be discussing the rotation curve of the Milky Way and its spiral arm structure using 21 centimeter radio astrophysics. So, for some background, we have to understand what you know 21 centimeter really means. Um, hydrogen makes up a lot of the interstellar matter in the Milky Way. Sorry, um, hydrogen makes up a lot of the interstellar matter in the Milky Way, and it's usually found in its ground state since the temperature of space is very low. But within its ground state, there are still two possible states. And these states differ in the relative alignment of the spins of the proton and the electron in hydrogen. And if the spins are in the same direction, the energy of the state is a little bit higher. And if the spins are in the opposite directions, the energy is a little bit lower. And the energy difference between these two states is about six micro EV. Um, and when hydrogen falls from the higher energy state to the lower energy state, it emits radiation that has a wavelength of 21 centimeters. So that's where that term comes from. And this wavelength happens to fall in the radio wave region, which means that you can detect it using radio telescopes. Um, the existence of this radiation was predicted in 1944 and it was discovered uh, in 51. So since we're gonna use a telescope, let's just review um, some basic antenna physics. Um, first, we assume that our, that, our, uh, that our source, in this case, the sun is a point source. Um, and then we can use uh, the fact that antennas follow reciprocity, which means that they act the same whether they behave, um, whether they are transmitting or receiving data. So, okay, let's think about how dishes transmit data. It will emit some sort of radiation. The radiation will spread around the bowl of the antenna and then it'll come to its focus and then it'll be emitted as a plane wave. Um, and the way that that basically works is the same as a circular aperture. So we expect that when the dish transmits data, it should follow the diffraction pattern of a circular aperture. And then due to reciprocity, we know that when the dish receives data, it should also behave like a circular aperture, which means that the antenna response function should behave like a circular aperture. The diffraction pattern of a circular aperture is given by this equation here. And um, it, it's called an airy function. And here's a graphical representation of this airy function. These airy functions have these really characteristic lobes that kind of diffuse out the further you get from the center. Um, and if we look at the response function of the antenna and fit it to the analytical form of the airy function, we can perform some basic uh, calculations to try to back calculate to solve for the, uh, the um, aperture of the dish to see how well our assumptions meet our data. So we're going to be using the big radio telescope on top of uh, building 54 at MIT. And this is an 18 foot aperture uh, parabolic radio antenna. And uh, we access th this remotely using a GUI. Um, we're gonna perform two analyses. One is gonna be a galactic scan of the Milky Way and the other is gonna be a grid scan of the sun. Um, for the galactic scan, we uh, went from zero to 360 degrees in steps of two degrees. And at each point we spent 20 seconds taking data. And for the solar grid scan, we went from minus five degrees to five degrees in steps of half a degree. Um, and then we spent 20 seconds taking data there. Um, we also repeated this scan three times and averaged over the data so we would have better statistics. So using our solar grid scan, we can make a plot of the antenna response versus latitude and longitude. Um, and that's called the point spread function. And essentially this is just a picture of the sun as you vary the angle of observation. And if we fix one of the angles and vary the other, we can find the intensity profile as a function of either the latitude or the longitude. So what I did is I chose, I set the latitude equal to zero. So we're slicing right in the middle of the sun. And um, I plotted the intensity versus the longitude. And that's shown by the blue tick marks here. And then we fit this to an area function with this red line here. Um, then by using some software packages to find the optimal fit values, we found um, the value for the aperture radius A which was about 2.4, 2.5 meters. And the actual radius aperture is about 2.7 meters. So there are clearly some assumptions that we've made that are um, making our calculations not agree with the actual values. Um, we will discuss where this discrepancy comes from when we discuss some uncertainty. Another thing that we have to understand for our experiment is how Doppler shifts affect our astronomical observations. Since the Milky Way is rotating, um, signals that are moving towards us are blue shifted and signals that are moving away from us are red shifted according to this equation, which is the Doppler shift equation. But only the, direction, only the velocities that are along the direction of observation are modified. So any signal that's perpendicular to the line of sight is not modified by Doppler shifting. And if we look at this diagram, 
we see that at certain points near the galactic center, like point two, um, all of the velocity is tangential to the line of sight. So that means that all of its velocity is redshifted, unlike maybe point one or point three here, where a lot of the velocity is perpendicular to the line of sight. Um, and all of its velocity is redshifted because in this diagram, it's moving away from us, right? So this means that if we look at the distributions of velocities along a line of sight, um, the velocity that is most redshifted corresponds to points like point two. Um, point two is also really easy to deal with because we know its radial distance from the center of the galaxy. Um, since it's tangential to the line of sight, we can just use some basic geometry to calculate its distance from the galactic center, um, where L is the angle of observation, also called the galactic longitude, and R0 is a constant for the Milky Way, which is just the distance, uh, is a constant for our, our solar system, which is just the distance from uh, the center of the galaxy to the sun. And um, if we the, the formula for the rotational velocity relative, um, the rotation, rotational velocity relative to the sun is given by this equation. So if we find the most redshifted velocities corresponding to points like point two for many lines of sight, um, we can plot the velocities against R as calculated here. And this will give us our rotation curve, which is just a plot of the rotational velocities versus how far you are from the galactic center. Um, using our galactic scan data, we can find those maximally shifted uh, redshift of velocities for points like point two. And we do this by looking at the power spectrum of 21 centimeter emissions, which, which essentially just tells us how much hydrogen we're seeing. And by transforming the frequencies to velocities, we can find the most redshifted and the most blue shifted velocities, which are shown here with the red, red and blue arrows. And I identified them by hand by essentially just going through each line of sight making a plot like this, and then clicking on the point that corresponds to the most redshifted velocity. Um, and if things were ideal, these bumps here would look something like a photon pulse. So they would shoot up and immediately drop back down. But here the signal is spread out due to the thermal broadening of the signal, which means that as the hydrogen tra transmission, as the hydrogen emission travels through space, it scatters off of dust and random stuff. It loses energy. And then when it gets to our telescope, um, the signal's a little bit more spread out than when it started. Um, so the best that we can do is just identify when the signal just starts to drop off. Um, I've associated an uncertainty with this fact about, of about 15 kilometers per second, which is about the half width of these peaks. And once we're able to identify these velocities for all given lines of sight L, we can calculate the corresponding R using that expression. And this will give us our rotation curve. So here's the rotation curve that we produced using that method. And um, I am showing these for radii between three and eight kiloparsecs. And the, we, can't, we can't use 21 centimeter data below three kiloparsecs because below that point, contributions due to dark matter take over. And above eight kiloparsecs, which corresponds to R naught, we can't use 21 centimeter data because you know, using that useful fact about points like point two, we, we have to find points that are tangential to our lines of sight. But if we're looking at a point that is further than the distance from the center of the galaxy to the sun, then we will not be able to identify a point that's tangential to the line of sight. Um, so we're going to have to use different, a different method than 21 centimeter um, emissions to, to calculate those velocities. Um, we also restrict ourselves to longitudes between 0 and 90 degrees, just so that the, the sine L is positive and we have uh, positive rotational velocities. Um, the data I've shown here is, uh, has an uncertainty of about 15 kilometers per second due to that thermal broadening effect. And below three kiloparsecs, I've added qualitative error bars to communicate the discrepancy due to the dark matter, um, but they're not quantitative error bars. Um, I've also plotted an interpolated polynomial um, from literature, uh, which seems to agree with the data largely. Um, so once we have this, we can actually do a little bit more with this data. And the next question that we ask is, how can we use our rotation curve to find the spiral arm structure of the Milky Way? So we're going to return to this diagram, but instead of looking at point two, we're going to look at something like point one or point three, where a lot of the velocity is perpendicular to the line of sight. And we can look at the 21 centimeter power spectrum to see where the most stuff is, because if we're looking, if we're looking at our universe, where the most stuff is going to be is where the spiral arms are dense. So we can say that where we see maxima in our intensity profile, that's probably where the spiral arms are. Um, those correspond to points that have velocities uh, that I've called V parallel in green, which are the velocities along the line of sight. 
And by combining uh, these equations, um, we can plot the locations of the most stuff for each line of sight, which should correspond to the spiral arms. So it just takes a little bit of algebra to relate these, these expressions to things that we can measure. Um, but once we do this, we can plot R as a function of the angle of observation uh, between zero and 90 degrees, and we can find the spiral arms. And this is what you get. And we see that we have some points below three kiloparsecs, but again, I'm gonna ignore that data because uh, at that point, dark, dark matter takes over, so those are unreliable. But beyond that, we see two pretty distinct chunks here, um, which correspond to two spiral arms. And I've compared this to this NASA figure, which is an artist rendition uh, based on actual data. And uh, we can see that these chunks probably correspond to the Sagittarius arm on the inner part over here and uh, the Norma arm or outer arm uh, on the outer part there. Um, this is only a qualitative comparison because it's just my best guess since I don't actually have uh, the data that produced this graphic. So we have to think about some sources of uncertainty here. Um, for the antenna response analysis, the main source of uncertainty is um, in our assumption that the sun is a point source and the fact that we were limited um, in statistical uh, in taking high statistics because it's cloudy all the time in Boston. So getting good sun scans is quite limited. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty with the assumption that the sun is a point source because the angular width of the sun is about half a degree, which is clearly not a zero dimensional point source. Um, also, when we have the analytical form of the airy function, we know that they have those very characteristic uh, airy lobes, which we should be able to see in our plot here, but we don't see this. And the reason for that is because the antenna noise and the thermal noise around the dish um, contributes an uncertainty on the order of about 10 to the minus 18 megawatts per Hertz which also happens to be the same order of the resolution of the airy lobes, which means that the antenna noise is gonna blur out our airy lobes, so we're not gonna see them. Um, for the galactic analysis, um, the main contributions uh, for our, uncertain our uncertainty are the reported uncertainties and the constants R naught and theta naught. Um, and um, we also have uh, the uncertainty in the method that we use to find the velocities. Um, there's also a systematic uncertainty from the telescope itself in the reported values of the velocities in the galactic longitudes, which I've reported here. For the galactic analysis, there are so many equations that we have to deal with. So we have to propagate these errors into all of these things, but I will not bore you with that. So I've summarized all the uncertainties in a nice little table here so that you just get to look at the numbers and not all of the gross math. So um, what could we have done to improve this project? Um, well, clearly for the solar analysis, the assumption that the sun is a point source is incorrect. So what we could do is try to calculate what the diffraction pattern should be from a spherical source, uh, a source object instead of a point source object, um, as we had originally assumed. It probably wouldn't hurt to take more data because we were a little bit limited with our statistics. Um, for the rotation curve and spiral arm analyses, I think a lot of the uncertainty was used was due to the method that I used to find the uncertainties, uh, to find the velocities, because I basically just clicked where my best guess was of those velocities and that was it. But um, I think you could write an algorithm to do that, that would do better, um, perhaps using the SciPy find peaks package. Um, I was also a little disappointed with how scarce my spiral arms were, but since the period of the sun is around, uh, so, but since the, the way that we would fill out that diagram more is by taking more data as the sun rotates around the Milky Way. But since the period of that happening is about 230 million years, um, I will leave it to my descendants to take care of that when they, when they take JLF themselves. Um, so to close, let's just chat about why this research is important. Um, for me, I found this experiment to be particularly exciting because it's, it's one thing to just stare up at the sky and be like, wow, Galileo was so great. He was so smart. Um, and just think about how people can be so clever as to just like look up and like understand how the universe works. But once you actually just sit down and do it yourself, you realize that the basic physics is pretty much just like Doppler shifts and some geometry and that's all it is. Um, but I've also realized that the heavy lifting really comes from the antenna engineers. So I'm just glad that I am a physicist and not an engineer. Um, it's also fascinating to me that something that you learn about in a quantum mechanics class, which is you know, the hyperfine splitting of hydrogen that produces this 21 centimeter emission has consequences that are very, very tangible and easy to measure. So this elementary physics um, is much closer to our day-to-day -day observations than we normally think. And it's particularly amazing to me that something that's quantum mechanical in scale on the scale of atoms and protons and electrons can describe to us these structures that are thousands and thousands of light years wide. Um, and that, that kind of like general 
applicability of physics is pretty amazing to me. Um, especially big thanks to professors Robinson and Pouse um, for being so helpful in understanding the semester and to Songbeck for all of his help as well. Um, and as always, thanks to my partner, Crime John, and my wonderful friend, Maya, for their constant support. Are there any questions?